<clears throat> nobody. 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 Nobody rage short stories. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Nobody Read Short Stories. This is the podcast where we read short stories so you don't have to. And you can find all of our previous episodes on our uh, website, nobodyreadshortstories.com. So tonight we have a wonderful story by Emily Franklin, and here is Michelle Murphy reading The Registry of Displaced Persons. The Registry of Displaced Persons by Emily Franklin. The girl's arm hangs loose as though she's picked up a limb from someone else and reattached it. Lucille glances at the chart. Amira, six, fell from tree. She was climbing, Nurse Diana reports to Lucille. They're always climbing, Lucille says, winking at Amira. The nurse looks offended. Lucille sweeps her hair out of her eyes, notices something stuck in a curl. Cheese? Yogurt? Acida, the boiled dough she'd eaten at some point last night, slopping it into kidney bean stew and then into her mouth with absent-minded accuracy. They climb trees and fall from trees because they're kids, Lucille says. Kids and trees, it's the same everywhere. Lucille palpates the girl's shoulder. Were you chasing a fire finch? Those round-bellied birds bejeweling the outer acacia branches, so docile they could sometimes be petted, especially now in the early morning, air bright. Amira nods, winces in pain, but not enough for Lucille to triage her ahead of a baby, now visible in the queue, who, from the looks of it, might already be dead, or, and here's where Lucille jumps in, about to die. Lucille's second assignment. She understands she won't save everyone, not even most. Why South Sudan? Her mother asked on WhatsApp back in August. Why not Detroit? Her brother wanted to know, also in their conversation. You could save lives on U.S. soil. What can I say? Lucille had typed back with her left thumb, right hand consumed with Kisra, bread made with teff flour and near-fermented yogurt. She ate whatever anyone left for the doctors. Bread, if there wasn't a shortage, dates in a bowl, anything to power through the hours. How about say you're coming back? Her brother sent her under a different conversation, one titled Just Us, which, given their father's early death and their mother's inattentiveness, was true. You go where they tell you, she'd written. It was freeing being sent somewhere, no choice. The truth is some people don't belong anywhere, she typed to her brother before delivering a set of twins by C-section. Three weeks post-date, Lucille figured, one live, the other already gone, wrapped around the viable newborn. A wheel, South Sudan's poorest state. Lucille had looked it up when she'd been told her assignment, had to look up all of Bar El Ghazal region, the maternal mortality rates, catastrophic malaria rates. She texted her husband Benjamin from the airport, but he had no reception between Damascus and Aleppo, so she could not send back his version of disaster math, the formulae of ruin. Lucille and three other doctors moved like one tentacled being, using everything at their disposal to try and help some of the swarms of people who showed up at all hours, lines extending out the vestibule tent. Inside the tents, rows of cot, tangle of lines, portable units, test after test, positive for malaria. Cause of death? Just put malaria, she'd been told her first day. Put preeclampsia untreated, put uterine rupture, put postpartum infection. Today is the same. She had typed to her brother when he asked how she was, how her day was going. She had escaped her New York life, gone to make a difference, but often felt she was barely helping. Lucille's days seemed together in a ragged quilt of surgeries, deliveries, diagnoses. 
She suctioned, cleaned, swathed babies if they survived, placed them in their mother's arms after she stitched them back together. Then she would retreat back to the conversation with her brother and whatever food she found in the provider station. On hand last night and early this morning, only a cedar and bean stew, cold and clumpy now. Her husband Benjamin sends a text, the kind of dwindled thing he sends when he wants to check in with her but doesn't know what to say. What time is it there? She doesn't know what to say to him now either, so types out, are you finished with your shift? But Lucille doesn't send what she's written, not yet. She sits with her mouth ringed in brown red sauce, engulfed by the next wave. Lucille scans the patients, laboring women, toddlers, a sick baby's waxy smooth head reflects the grimy overhead light. The baby's praying mantis thin arms drape one over the other. But what magnetizes Lucille is this tiny human's demeanor, giving up as though the infant who can't possibly have the words is telling her, it's already over, go home now. Acquiescence swaths the baby's limbs, the same defeat Lucille had fought off for so many months that now hunkers down, taking root inside of her. Lucille glances over the patient line for other critical cases, settles on the infant in front of her and rattles off a set of concerns. Severe dehydration, obviously, acute distress, chronic malnourishment, Lucille checks the baby's upper arm circumference with her thumb and middle fingers. Crude, but she'd seen enough to have an idea. What do you think, 10 months? Diana, the nurse, wrinkles her mouth, unsure. Lucille checks for bilateral edema. Pitting, Lucille says, maybe seven months. Diana, holding the baby, swaying, asks, Risomol? Half strength standard low osmolarity oil rehydration solution and add potassium and glucose. Lucille, satisfied with this initial treatment, pivots to go to the next in need, but stops. Wait, if we think the baby's choleric, it should be a standard dose. I'll be right back. Pregnant women and kids under 15. That's my gig. She texted her brother at the tail end of August, after a few weeks of her assignment, but before the cholera outbreak, the flooding. Her brother was the one who suggested she'd open a clinic in Detroit, keep her altruistic visions domestic. Her brother was an actor, on location somewhere in the deep south or deep Midwest. She couldn't recall the specifics of this film since he went back to back, rom-com to thriller, trading a leather jacket for lawyer garb, easily slipping into someone else's skin. She admired that, had dreamed of exploration of others' lives, but had studied instead, keeping right on track with medical school, residency, fellowship. Lucille had used her fingernail to pick at a scab on her knee. She knew she shouldn't, but Picking had always been soothing, as though she were peeking underneath not only her exterior dermis, but whatever, whomever, was in there. It's not a bad gig, she typed back that first week in case her brother thought she was having second thoughts. That she'd just been swayed by Benjamin to abandon life in New York. It's not a bad gig. She typed back that first week in case her brother thought she was having second thoughts, that she'd just been swayed by Benjamin to abandon life in New York. They'd applied together to work in Juba, the capital, but Benjamin had been assigned to another country entirely and packed for Aleppo, the goal to plow through crisis with or without her. A conceited do-gooder, her brother said of Benjamin. How is that possible? Lucille had asked, but she knew her husband's competitive selflessness. It had attracted her, but she didn't know how it would play out in the field and they hadn't been placed together anyway. Lucille had landed in Juba and after a day was removed, placed in a wheel instead with its one to seven maternal mortality rate, the highest in the world. 
and more internally displaced people than any other country, she texted. Some gig, her brother wrote. Won't you be homesick? No. What's wrong with me? <laughs> There's probably a long German word for someone like me, she wrote. Someone with emotional rust, someone who isn't at home anywhere. Her brother typed, Vegabunder Camperschnitzel, and other fake German words that made her laugh. <laughs> when she didn't write back, he asked, What about the other docs? Four docs, rotating nurses, night, day shifts. Lucille hesitated. I'm the only woman. Lucille waited for a response. Her brother could be in makeup, blush brushes dusting his cheeks, or could be on another call. Or he could know exactly what she meant because he knew her, had that sibling subtext no matter how far the distance. My silence should read as a, hmm. Her brother put stage directions or off-screen commentary in his texts. Fuck you. One's gay. One's always gay, he wrote. Her brother was gay, partnered, had a cottage off the coast where he lived with Itamar in between films. One's old, she wrote. You're old. I'm 40, Lucille wrote and said aloud to no one eyebrows up in a faux-shocked parenthesis. Not old. Not too old, you mean. Cue rising, swelling music. She didn't say too old for what. Is that what happened to 40? Days of reckoning? The wish for whatever was next to just appear in a Houdini puff and cape? Instead of saying this to her brother, she picked off the scab. Blood, ragged skin, nothing like a magic eight ball showing her true self, true desire underneath the scab, just muck. I'm not a moron, her brother wrote back. You didn't mention the other one. The other what? Are you sure you're qualified to cut people open? He sent a turd emoji. The other dude. Here, Lucille had paused. She thought of the hot morning when she'd first arrived. Thatched hut shaded under a graceful acacia tree. Nurses running the malaria station. Temp, pinprick, solution test, sugar for kids to counteract their hypoglycemia. Waving to her as though they would meet for Starbucks later. Not everyone had waved to her. Not all the doctors were friendly. Busy, maybe, or just culturally less familiar less American. I'm raising my eyebrows here, Nashama. She warmed at her brother's endearment for her, dear soul, left over from their Jewish day, school days. I'm literally tapping my foot here, in a waiting way, not in a gay brother and show business way. Spill. Josh. Her finger left a powdery splotch on the phone screen. His name is Josh. There, her brother had written, you said it. The baby seems limper than just five minutes before. Lucille scans the room, doing an inventory of other patients, the door flapping, letting in breeze, heat, and dust. Exhaustion runs so deep, she is sure it could be found in her marrow. She feels undone by proving to herself that everything could be fixed or that she could attempt the fixing. We need to step up our game, Lucille says, hating that she sounds like her husband during the stoop sale in which they'd sold most of their belongings. Her assignment was nine months, his 12, but it was easier to shed the contents of their apartment than to think about storage or the emotional expense of keeping boxes with his parents in their stately Nantucket place. Lucille had never felt at home there, even in a borrowed Lily Pulitzer dress even with a wedding ring. So they decided to unburden themselves of worldly goods. Go big or go home, Benjamin had said, foisting sweaters they wouldn't pack and an old step stool on whoever would take them. Let's step up our game here, Weisskopf. 
Her husband was full of phrases that suited chest tube decompression of a pneumothorax or stoop sales alike. Only one item hadn't sold, a box of CDs. No one wants Duran Duran, I guess, she told her brother. I want those eyelinered boys forever, he said, and understood her sorrow wasn't only about the items, but about time collapsing in on itself, objects becoming obsolete. So Lucille had slipped a few CDs into her luggage, and sure enough, when the time came to wipe down post-surgical scenes or sit outside in the shade with a club pineapple from the only local, Lucille and the others would have Rio or Save a Prayer in the background, as though she and her seventh grade self are still the same person, still waiting for her real life to start. Point me in the right direction, Diana says, stethoscope swaying around her chest. NG tube? Nasogastric intubation makes sense. We'll go in the nose, past the throat, into the stomach, Lucille says, as though narrating for an audience. But what Lucille wants is to hold the baby. No, she does not want to hold the baby. No, she wants the baby to just be well, veins filled and pitting edema subsided. She wants to have already saved her and be looking back on a job well done. Let's hold off on the anti tube just for now. Try a dropper. She feels the way she had when her brother had come to visit in residency and taught her, post-call and delirious with fatigue, how to make their Nana shuttle bread. She'd been oily handed and confused, unable to hold on to anything. All the dough balls heaped together in a bunt pan they later gave away at the stoop sale. It's the same now, only she doesn't have her brother's wit and sure-footed presence next to her. Lucille had thought herself stronger, immune to battle fatigue, but she knows it's happening. Her limbs, lungs, everything crumbling, exhausted and worn, hours roped together, nodded by the eldest of a set of six siblings, staring at her now when she darts in and out of the waiting room, leaving patients who all need her, their need the only thing that's keeping her from splitting apart. Needing to save people came in waves, distant and slim sometimes, or like now, acute and pounding. Maybe this was what fueled Benjamin, pushed him to excel through med school and writing New Yorker articles while running the trauma unit and applying for his current station in Aleppo. You have to get pumped, he said, sounding ridiculous in his surgical scrubs, gauzy cap and booties too, when he convinced her to fill out the paperwork. Or maybe he just felt the need to bypass her since she'd already been to Haiti for two years before they'd met, survived the earthquake, stayed an additional six months and come back. Let me check something. Lucille points to the limp infant. Lucille had woken up this morning with what she thought was a fever, but turned out to be malaise. Lucille had woken up this morning, hit with what she thought was a fever, but turned out to be malaise. You just want, you just want today to be different. She'd texted her brother. Stop using second person, he'd written. See, I'm giving you notes like a director. Fine. I woke up feeling like crap, and I want today to be different. Now, Lucille feels it couldn't possibly be different. Another sick baby, sweat sheen, delicate toes, head lolling. Where's the parent, anyway? Diana, who holds the baby, says... I think her uncle brought her, but she was just left on the chaise. Diana gestures to the sick cot, which they'd nicknamed the chaise, just for non-existent glamour, where people first sit until told to move up the medical queue for treatment. Now it's filled with another patient and will be constantly occupied. Before, when you were eating, Dr. Archambault said to treat those siblings first, then the baby, Diana says to Lucille. One versus three, I get it, Lucille says, calculating loss. But she feels herself pulled to the baby. Today could be different. She could save, 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 and report back to her brother. She checks for a pulse in the carotid artery, then radial, femoral, even popliteal behind the knee. 
the baby rouses slightly, makes a noise that sounds like a giggle, which makes Lucille smile, frown, and detach all at once. Lucille regrets the kidney stew she picked at all night and before sunrise this morning. Unlike Josh, who'd arrived from Minnesota and promptly had invasive intestinal issues for his first couple of months, she'd been fine. Not even diarrhea, but probably because Adut brought Lucille homemade cultured milk drinks, sort of like a local probiotic. Adut, whose baby Lucille saved her fourth day in a wheel, giving both the community and Lucille false hope regarding her success rate. Adut kept bringing the baby, whom she'd named James, to see Lucille. And along with James, some homemade food insisting that Dr. Lucille could not do her good work without being properly fed. Sometimes, Adut showed up at the hospital with spinach and peanut butter soup or Lucille's small room with mashi stuffed peppers bright as traffic lights. And sometimes Lucille would cry and Adut would hug her and Lucille felt like a total asshole because Adut's husband was dead. Her parents were dead. Her other child had wandered away and likely drowned and Adut and baby James had little food to share but did so anyway. And here was Lucille, year after year of schooling and training and choosing to fly 7,000 miles to try and help others and yet, crying. What right did she have? And as Adut hugged her, she put baby James between them, gurgling and toothless and wet-eyed. Lucille would, for the two and a half minutes it took to sing James Taylor's prairie lullaby to baby James of South Sudan, feel okay. Not great, but okay. But Adut hadn't shown up yesterday, Unusual, but not unheard of. And Lucille had gone ahead and eaten the stew someone else had made for the ceremony a few days before. Lucille had dug around in the common kitchen in the middle of the night, unable to sleep, hungry, and twitching with the brokenness around her. In her. Make sure you're eating, her brother had texted her. There's nothing but leftovers. Funeral food, she texted back. How can I eat that? He sent an emoji a wrinkled mouthed face. What kind of Jew would you be if you didn't? So maybe the stew is bad or she caught some bug or just that she hadn't slept more than a couple of hours over the past five days with the influx of critical cases, the outbreak of disease, even among the staff, the funerals and ceremonies. But she fights back the bile and trains her eyes on the lethargic baby Diana offers small as a loaf of bread. Do you want to take her? Diana pushes the listless body toward Lucille. What Lucille wants doesn't really matter, does it? She'd been learning that each day. You could want to undo the decisions made in your 20s, or you could want something simple. Two hours of uninterrupted sleep, for example. But just because the want existed didn't mean you got it even if wanting it made sense. Lucille swipes antibacterial gel onto her hands. Lucille takes the infant, weighs her, and notes 7.26 kilograms. Jots malaria, malnutrition, motions for help. We really have to push fluid. She's barely 16 pounds. <sighs> How easy it is, always has been, to push away desires. She'd left her old life behind in the hopes of having nothing she'd needed. No broken bits to pick up. She could put this baby out of her mind too. Today, yesterday, tomorrow, all the same, crushing her because Lucille, as Josh had pointed out, cataloged her losses instead of her saves. I'm not sure what that says about me, she'd told him. It says you want to do better, Josh had said. But this baby here? Lucille isn't sure. Could she be rehydrated? Lucille isn't sure. Could she be rehydrated? Get well, thrive, put on weight, make it to her first birthday? Or will Lucille have to add her to her file of failures? Names memorized, entered into a ledger that exists only in her mind, only in the privacy of her room at night. 
If she went back to the States as planned in a few days, she would repeat the names of these losses, unfurling the list of fatalities, deaths. Only this baby, brown leg out of the muslin someone had wrapped her in, reaches for Lucille's face. Lucille bends forward. She knows clinically this reach isn't directed at her specifically, just someone at close range, but still. The matchbook-sized palm, fingers slim and cold on Lucille's chin near her mouth. Lucille has the urge to kiss and nuzzle these fingers, this baby. Dr. Weisskopf, those siblings in the vestibule, they need you. Lucille nods. She holds the baby to her chest, not wanting to put her down because she's so small. Someone might not see her and sit on her. Or she might fall from a table if no one was watching. Okay, just use this. Lucille jostles the baby so she can remove the macrame belt Josh had made and given to her. Not her style, more hippie guitar player on the quad than polished physician, but she wore it anyway. Strap her down on the gurney with it. We're out of the ties. See if you can get her to take a few drops of solution by mouth, gentle, like a bird. The doctors and nurses were French, American, Dutch, Indonesian, Canadian, Moroccan. Lucille found herself speaking a kind of English that sounded as though it had been put through an online translator and back into English. Like a bird? Where had that come from? Maybe it came from her quiet grandfather who survived Sobibor, the rising there who had then been held with other Ukrainians at the displaced persons camp. He liked to tell Lucille and her brothers a story about a gentle bird eating honeysuckle, some old poem involving bees and flowers that didn't seem to make sense in translation, but that Lucille loved. Just a few drops at a time, okay? Lucille said. The vestibule would have been airy, light, a respite on someone's patio at home, but at the clinic was crowded with plastic chairs. The cholera outbreak after August flooding reminded Lucille of her time in Haiti, the amalgam of human odor and plant life. The spread was blamed partially on poor distribution of health supplies and logistical problems, partly on the disease's virulence, how useless it was to vaccinate after the fact. In point of fact, she told Benjamin in a lengthy text. You can't really predict who will live or die here. Benjamin had written back. Isn't that true everywhere? Lucille saw three siblings standing together, a wobbly set of tinker toy legs and arms, a structure of siblings. She made a note to tell her brother. She didn't type things like that to Benjamin any longer. He didn't respond the way she wanted thought she wasted time noticing things, wondering. But she had to wonder, and did so aloud with Josh frequently. It wasn't just the proximity that made her say these things to Josh, or the heat, or the loneliness that crept up her back at the end of a long shift. Lucille recognized that Benjamin was correct. Time was the problem. That is, she'd picked Benjamin back in her mid-twenties fallen in with him in a haze of residency hours and takeout. It wasn't really practical being married to the same person forever, unless stasis kicked in and your blood stopped circulating, theoretically, or you just stayed exactly the same person you'd been way back when, improbable or boring at best. It wasn't that she'd chosen wrong, just that she'd chosen differently than she would in her present day self. Now there are three kids in front of her, the tallest brother like a human cat of nine tails, stretched and tall. He tried to get the mangoes, the middle child says, thumbing to his older brother, at the top of the tree. I see, Lucille nods, mentally triaging the siblings. A dude's kid who wandered away, had been a tree climber, a mango eater. A dut had brought a pudding, a custard so tart it made Lucille's eyes water, which a dut had assumed was just more tears. Such a sad, 
heroic American doctor. Where had Adut gone? Why hadn't she shown up? Lucille puzzles over this as her eyes flit from one child to the next, little sister, middle brother, older brother, all with open fractures to arms or tibia. We are alone, the girl answers before she can ask. More parentless children. The Sudanese called her doctor or Kawaja, foreigner. Some doctors minded the term. Lucille did not. She felt like a foreigner here as she had in Haiti, even at home or in the hospital. Maybe, she'd said to Josh, not having a home is simpler. Diana, Lucille calls, swap places with me. Lucille tries to sound casual, but feels a stinging in her mouth. She needs to be with the limp baby. Diana comes closer. We need backup if the fluids aren't working. Can you wake Catalin? Catalin, Dutch and brusque, but the best at inserting the toughest IVs. Dehydrated, withered veins, tiny arms. Probably we can get away with casting one or two, but probably surgery here. It's too expanded. Lucille holds the middle boy's shoulder so she can check him, but he tilts suddenly. Your leg too? Lucille kneels down to look. She catches herself looking past the siblings to the baby, then forces herself to refocus. He got a snake bite to the foot, the sister says. Lucille speaks to the kids and to Diana. The bones are rotted here. She draws a line in the arm down the boy's femur. How long ago was this snake bite? The oldest boy opens his mouth. Two years. The middle boy looks at his snake-bitten leg and clicks his tongue. It was a long way to get here. She picks the boy up, puts him on the table, and arranges two chairs for his siblings on either side. Ignoring her upset stomach, she wonders again where Adut is, why she didn't visit yesterday. You relied on order, structure away from home. That's what the pre-assignment meeting suggested. Lucille writes a note and hands it to Diana. The boy's going to lose his leg tonight. Call the ducks. The ducks was the nice term for the doctors. Docs. Ducks, it sounded like, with Dr. Archambault's French accent. Everyone was slightly interchangeable from a clinical perspective. Even though in the summer insect throng of her room, Lucille felt no one could do what Josh could. He had that kind of presence. Everyone remarked on it. He could juggle new, obscure, in-field procedures and had a way with accents. Have you heard him recite the Pledge of Allegiance with an Irish into Scots accent? Diana had asked Lucille one afternoon back in September as they restocked the shelves from a large shipment. I have not had the pleasure, Lucille said, lips pursed. She felt a bit of pride not fawning over Josh, as though keeping her distance made her stronger. So, Diana had asked, you're not married? She thought Diana was making a point. I am, Lucille said, but individuals are matched to specific roles, so couples aren't usually placed together. Lucille had looked for Josh, but he wasn't in yet, or was outside in the malaria hut, or just didn't want to see her. I'm emergency, Benjamin's anesthesia. Lucille realized that sounded more descriptive of their personalities than she wanted. She kept stocking the shelf, efficient and orderly, her face neatly arranged too. I mean, Benjamin can be anywhere, and so can I. Just not together, Josh said then from the doorway, holding his arm up as though about to catch a baseball. Right. Lucille said and was about to explain how she was fine, just fine, on her own when she saw the reason for Josh's elevated limb, the dark blood slipping over his wrist, up the forearm. You need some help there? Josh thought about it. Sure. Just a camping knife blunder. He had watched Diana leave and added, I do know how to stitch myself, though. I'm sure you do, Lucille said. Of course, his extreme competency enthralled her. They all had it, but he was relaxed about it. Funny, as though he'd stumbled into being able to do all kinds of things. 
She got out a suture kit and patted the stool next to her. Josh had watched her work, impressed at the neatness, the quiet clang of tool and swipe of antiseptic. You know all this shit too, right? Lucille shrugged. She had not been raised to speak of her abilities, just to do them. It was work. Benjamin took care of the bluster for both of them. Her brother too. Are you asking if I can juggle? Because the answer is yes. A smile played on Josh's mouth as she went on. Fire, chainsaws, chickens. That seems like a potentially messy combination, Josh had said, his face close to Lucille's, skin warm from September sun. She hadn't responded. She could not juggle, balls or anything else. She had finished suturing Josh's lacerated hand with a vertical mattress stitch, cleaned everything up in one gauzy napkin, and gone out to help the real patients. In early October, two months in, Josh had become sick enough to call her to his bedroom. Sweating through the only clean sheets he'd had, he'd lost so much liquid he'd told Lucille to banana bag him. Thiamine, folic acid, vitamins, magnesium sulfate slipping into his bloodstream. Lucille had wiped his face with the high absorbency towel she had bought at Eastern Mountain Sports with Benjamin the day before leaving. Benjamin was prepared, always listing, checking off, cross-referencing, but you couldn't plan for this, right? Couldn't plan for Josh getting better, banana bag, tincture of time, or Lucille's vigil over his damp bed, his slim, sinewy body weighty with fever, Lucille wringing the towel, mopping up again, blanking when he asked her to sing to him. How had she forgotten every song she'd ever known? Back in New York, Benjamin had appreciated art and music, but not Lucille's folksy voice. Maybe this caused Lucille to blank on everything. TV theme songs, pop hits, opera, all gone. Except, Den lille ole med perplin the Danish lullaby her grandfather had sung to her. Josh had fever dozed and she'd sung to him, half laughing and half amazed that they, two American Jews, could be working in South Sudan with a Danish soundtrack courtesy of her now dead Ukrainian papa. Songs he'd smuggled into the displaced persons camp before his forced choice. Palestine illegally, but with a cousin or the U.S. alone. You're like Joni and Carly rolled into one, Josh had said one night. At least that's what Lucille thought he'd said, but she was checking his blood pressure at the time so she could have misheard. She swiped the towel across Josh's wide forehead. Sing to me more, he said to her, and she blushed so much, fingers wobbly on her thighs, that he might have been commanding that she orgasm right there. How revealing. Too much, too soon. She had lost her entire catalog of music, even the Danish song. But eventually she found something. Prince. Really? <laughs> You're going with raspberry beret? Josh had coughed. Prince was a king among men, sent to earth from the heavens or something. She breathed in Josh's smell. You must be feeling better if you're critiquing my choices. Not criticizing, Josh said, just amused. And he'd fallen asleep. And then those weeks in the late October floods, everything wet and mud slopped. How good it had felt to deliver a healthy infant in the rain, to pass that baby to the mother, also alive, everyone drenched. How good Lucille felt sliding into her dry sheets after Halloween, her feet bare, a rhythmic ticking from electrical wires out her window. You awake? Josh's voice had been soft as a storm end, a whisper of beer under his breath as he edged closer from the door. She hadn't said no or yes. Yes meant come here, and no meant go away. So nothing seemed the correct choice. How systematic of you, she imagined her husband saying. 
I know you're awake. Yes. And Josh had taken care to remove his shoes, not his clothing. He had athletic shorts and socks, a plain dark t-shirt she'd wished he would take off. Fully dressed, he peeled back the sheet, faced her, and pulled her close. And that was it. Nurse Catalan can't do the IV. She isn't feeling well. Diana sticks her head into the curved ceiling room where Lucille splints the sister's arm, protecting the fracture with compact padding. Food poisoning, maybe? Lucille nods. Might be. She doesn't mention her own churning stomach. Better to power through or chug electrolyte solution preemptively or tap into her personal stash of antimedics. Do you want to start the IV? Diana has the wilting bouquet of baby in her arms. I could try. Let me know if you need me, Lucille says and avoids looking too long at the baby. Marionette limbs, perfect tiny mouth rimmed in dried flaky skin. She worries that if she tries the IV herself, her shaky hands will betray her. There is nothing a magic about that one sick baby. She is no different than the other hundreds Lucille had treated or lost or delivered. Only even with the three siblings sad and expectant in front of her, Lucille thinks about swooping that baby up into her arms and rushing back to her room, swaddling, cuddling, even nursing. Hadn't there been articles written about spontaneous lactation? That desire could take over and produce enough pituitary hormones to make adoptive mothers able to nurse? We have a surgeon here, Dr. Betancourt, Lucille tells the siblings. He's really careful, really good. She looks at them. I have to wait on another patient. Wait here, okay? Lucille had purchased an obnoxiously bright Frisbee at the Baltimore airport, but hadn't taken it from her pack until November. If they had had a couple of minutes in the early evening, Josh and Diana had flung it back and forth in the dusty swath of land behind the malaria hut. Why would you buy it if you don't know how to play? Diana had asked. They were relishing those dry December days after the flooding, even with the rank smells. I can't answer that, Lucille had said, making sure to focus on the disc itself, to avoid Josh's eyes, his face, his shoulders, the air electric around him. But electric with what? Lucille thought maybe she wanted Josh because he was further along, more developed than her. In the gnat swarmed chaotic air, night burgeoning, who was she, really? It didn't seem to make sense that you were just one being, one human experiencing only one set of things when you could flowchart so many possibilities. She had watched Josh go into the malaria hut and come out, using the frisbee as a plate for cake someone had baked, a stodgy, milky thing with a fruit layer that weeks after was crusted onto the frisbee's rim. You do that here, she texted her brother. Use whatever you have at your disposal. And just what do you have? Her brother had written back. Later, she and Josh had been nearly head to head, leaning over a patient in the hot lights. That tough delivery, lots of previous scarring, third baby, dehydrated mother. Josh, patient and frustrated at the loss of blood, adding to the maternal mortality rate. It's our fucking job not to have that happen. He had said. We did our jobs, Lucille had said. You can't flowchart too much or you'd wind up unable to process anything. We aren't magicians. But Josh seemed like one, slipping into bed next to her that night too. He might as well have a rabbit and a top hat. Some weeks had passed. A month. They'd lit a makeshift menorah around Hanukkah sang songs filled with snowy lyrics and silver bells. She had delivered spontaneous twins, the first normal and the second one flipped in breech, umbilical cord wrapped around the neck. Josh performed needle pericardiocentesis, draining fluid around a woman's heart, a small amount that accumulated quickly after a makeshift shelf fell on her chest, her heart too squashed to beat adequately. As Josh had stitched or delivered, he whisper sang Starman, and as it often did, his voice made Lucille's chest clench, her vaginal muscles too. She sewed 
and also let herself imagine his fingers slipping inside her. Maybe he would do that and sing those lyrics. Didn't know what time it was. Light slow. All of Bowie's words mixing with the smell of betadine. She told him about her assignments. He'd said South Sudan was his first. He was from Boston, a family of intellectual Jews who made their own Haggadah, read Philip Larkin at Passover instead of praying, had lost his sister at 15. Lucille knew Josh was a better human than most, that he wrote actual letters to his mother, still daughterless, an art history professor, and his father, a judge, back in Boston. That Josh had been married, divorced, was younger than she by a handful of years that didn't seem to matter. That he had listened to Lucille describe a brutal day on her first infield placement, a lateral canthotomy, trauma to the face, hematoma behind the eyeball that pushed it forward, compressed the globe. Josh had sat very still as Lucille recalled the treatment, rapid decompression by cutting the ligaments around the eye. I mean, the patient's awake, it's awful. You're like, I'm going to cut your face open, okay? Josh nodded. But it was a Hail Mary, right? A sight-saving procedure? Your glass is just half full, huh? She asked. Josh grinned, his optimism alluring, drug-like. Sexual, almost. Her husband sent a message from Aleppo in mid-January. Lou, would you consider coming here? There's no one to deliver babies anymore, no place for it. Worse than where you are, no? We can't be in the habit of comparing tragedies, she wrote back, which was her way of telling him she wouldn't. Then that February weekend, dusty roads, crisp denim drying on the line, her assignment would be up in a couple of months unless she asked to extend. And then, where would she be? What you got there? Josh had asked. Sesame candy. Halawa sim sim, she had told Josh. Adut had taught her to make it. Roasted sesame seeds with caramelized sugar. Halawa sim sim, he said, and played a song on his guitar with made up words. Sim Sim, Slim Jim, my mom's got a fish fin, <laughs> until she put a piece in his mouth to shut him up. They crunched in amiable quiet, and then he'd left. That was it, she decided. Enough of those nights sleep pressed against each other, songs whispered, only to have him leave. She had put on leggings that made her knees itch, flip-flops, and one of the moisture-wicking shirts from EMS's sale rack, a size too large that made her feel both smaller and tougher than she really was. You awake? She hadn't waited for Josh's answer. Instead, she flip-flopped over to his bed, clunked the guitar which made discordant twangs, and tapped Josh on the shoulder. She waited for him to sit up, but he didn't. I know you're awake, Josh. I'm awake. He'd reached for her fidgety hands and put them under his shirt, onto his chest. The warmth from his body made her oozy with desire. He had been waiting for her. Maybe. Not wanting to nudge her fully into an affair, but now gripped her hips, pulled her onto him, sitting up to meet her face to face. I'm awake too, she said. Yeah. Josh leaned in and kissed Lucille's mouth, her arms around his waist, writhing. The thing is, Josh said to her afterwards, I'm kind of a dick. I don't believe that, Lucille said. I was. I really was. I'm just different now. He looked sorry. Okay, so you're a truth-telling non-dick now? <laughs> What was she? I guess. In full disclosure? I know you can't juggle, Josh said. Lucille nodded. True. But I can pluck a chicken or skin a fish or shoot a lamb if it's lame and needs to be put down. Jesus, Josh had said in the dark. 
I'm like jealous of all those animals. NG tubes a no go, Diana says. Diana has her pull tab mouth on. Diana has her pull tab mouth on. Lips in a defeated one sided parenthesis. Try Catalan again. Get her to do half strength Darrow solution with 5% dextrose or Ringer's lactate solution with 5% dextrose. We might not have more, Diana says, trying to be gentle with Lucille. So then what? Lucille notes Diana's kindness and feels it catch under her ribs. Break or bristle. Those are the options. Lucille notes Diana's kindness and feels it catch under her ribs. Break or bristle. Those are the options. She holds back, clenched. All right, then. 0.45% saline and 5% dextrose. Just get Catalan. Diane grimaces. Catalan's sick, like actively vomiting. I don't care. We're all fighting something, Lucille says. Tough now. The key is compartmentalizing, getting on despite everything, nausea percolating. There's Zofrin in my jacket pocket. Give her one. Crush it under her tongue so it works faster. And tell her I need her to start a fucking IV. The dwindling hope makes Lucille miss her brother, miss her mother, who would be horrified and overwhelmed if she saw the scene. Miss Josh's voice, which she can hear in her head, and it makes her smile. She misses Adut and baby James, who ought to have come by already. I don't think the baby's going to make it. Diana says, that's not an option, Lucille says, but she knows it sounds ridiculous. It is always an option. She rattles off information to Dr. Betancourt, who wears gowns streaked with betadine and blood from treating the siblings. Oui, mon robe de femme, malaria, malnutrition nutrition terrible, he said, and left them to it. I'm going to get Catalan if no one else will. Lucille says when Diana comes back without help. She sort of passed out. It must be some pretty bad stew. I'm ignoring my symptoms, Lucille says, then thinks maybe she is a gifted ignorer, especially now, and how maybe that isn't such a great thing. Or maybe it's self-preservation. Intraosseous needle? It was a brute last-ditch effort procedure. The only time she'd ever done one was during residency. A teenage patient with encephalitis, 4 a.m., fever of 107, coding with no IV access because she'd been on the ward for so long. Let's do it. An IO. Her other IO had died. Now Lucille sticks a wide bore needle into the baby's leg, proximal tibia, and into the bone marrow, that sickening egg crack during insertion. Diana cradles the baby's body, her head. Lucille lets out a gasping sigh, her stomach now recoiling. Maybe today was different already. She was saving and not puking. A double win, as Josh would say. Look, Diana said and gestured with her chin to the baby's eyes. She's already responding. Good call. It's the Shabbat after Passover, Josh had said. Outside, early April's golf ball-sized hail made a drum of the tents, the entire clinic and the residential hall a percussion section. March had passed in nights rippled with heat, swarms of flies, gnats. How do you even know that? Lucille asked. She'd only known about Passover because her brother had sent a string of bread emojis, baguette, ciabatta, challah, which had given her the idea of baking a loaf for Adut. Because I have a cool invention called a calendar? It's new. Lucille smirked. Well, then we'll make a key-shaped challah loaf. She turned to Adut, but also knew she was speaking to Josh to show him that she knew these customs, even if she didn't practice. There's an Ashkenazi custom, Adut. Schlissel challah. My grandfather made it, even in the displaced persons camp, and then he made it for us. He actually made individual loaves, tiny ones shaped like keys for me and my brother. I thought the keys went inside the bread, Josh had said, because God kept all the good stuff locked up and praying is the key. Adut had watched the doctors go back and forth, a small smile slipping onto her mouth as she needed. Or maybe I'm messing it up and it's to make merit for healing. Maybe it's good luck, Adut had offered. I think you're right. 
my grandfather said, Schlüssel is a blessing itself. So now we split it into strands and braid them. She demonstrated. Josh made a clumsy braid and then redid it. Lucille had wiped her hands on her thighs and rummaging in her dirty backpack. Here. She held out a sawtooth key, lone and brassy in her palm. What's that for? Josh asked. There was nothing to lock here, no items of value. Lucille shrugged. Could be my place. Josh stared at her hard, held her gaze. Don't you need it then? Lucille shook her head. Sold. Adut had taken the key, shown it to James, and then pressed it into the deep folds of the challah. Like that? Yeah, Lucille had said. She put her oily hand into Josh's, both of their palms on the braided loaf. Like that. You better come here, Diana says to Lucille, who leans into the counter in the staff room, poking for crackers or a stray piece of fruit. Lucille clenches her stomach. The baby? I thought she was doing better. She is. Just, just come see. Diana tugs Lucille by the elbow skin, through one tent flap and into where the baby, on Dr. Betancourt's lap, gives a limp wave. Lucille treads carefully toward her as though the infant might bolt, spring to life, or morph into one of the white-eared cob that swished across the wetlands during migrations. Hi there. Dr. Betancourt sighed and looked at Lucille. The craziest thing. One minute she's nearly gone, and the next she's asking for water. Water, the baby repeats. Lucille flinches, moves closer, speaks to the baby, but not in the hushed tones of lullabies and soothing. You have words, she says, plain and clear. This makes no sense, she turns to Diana. She's an infant. Then Lucille pivots to the baby. Just how old are you? Lucille's eyes are full. She feels on the verge of losing control, puddling down right there on the floor in her hospital garb. The baby child tries to hold up some fingers two maybe even three dr Betancourt says i can't fucking believe it language diana says dr Betancourt shrugs amazed and horrified dr Betancourt stands up hands the child to lucille who hesitates lucille come on dr Betancourt's tone is soft Lucille holds the tiny toddler, swaying with relief, then forces herself to pass her back to Diana so she can check back on the siblings. Dr. Weisskopf. Lucille looks up from where she squats, checking on the eldest sibling's wound dressings. It's the baby, Diana says. Lucille grins. The baby girl had rallied. Head upright, lips pink. Not a smile yet, but it would come. Doctor? Let me guess. She wants bread. Lucia wonders if she should make another loaf of shala, this time without a key. Feed it to the girl. No, Diana says. She's tanking. Moments later, the baby, child, toddler, is limp again. Lucille begins compressions, counting out time on her narrow chest. She knows it's useless. The child won't survive. Again, today is not different. Another late April day, another face to add to her visual registry, her compilation of losses. Why were those indelible? And the saves were like murmurations, clouds of starlings that showed up and just as quickly dispersed. Diana taps Lucille on the shoulder. You have a visitor. Lucille rises from her hunched position over the gurney to see Adut at the tented doorway, parcel in one arm, baby James in the other. Lucille hugs Adut, touches James, and when he smiles at her, she doesn't cry. This is James! James would have died, could have died, but didn't. Surely that's worth the whole mission. I didn't see you yesterday. I was worried. Lucille exaggerates her frown and forehead to show concern. I'm bringing you this, Adut says. It was far away. 
Adut gives James to Lucille, and for one millisecond, Lucille entertains the thought that Adut is giving her the child, which would be wrong and inexplicable, and yet... But Adut unwraps the parcel instead, a black thobe, the fabric unfurling, puddling on the ground like stained water. For you, Adut says to Lucille, because of the Dr. Josh. The stew rises in Lucille's mouth as the past few days rush back at her. She thrusts baby James back to his mom and runs to heave into the sink. Three days of mourning, ceremonial food, while life in the clinic continued on. Josh's body sent back. She heaves again, remembering. Fever, chills, daily issues. I'm boring. Josh had said just 10 days before as he coughed into the sleeve of the sweatshirt they'd been sharing. Lucille had almost forgotten it had started off as Benjamin's. You're not boring, she told him. You're just worn down. She offered the antibiotics they were all supposed to take at the first signs of illness. Josh had pushed them away, determined his stellar immune system would kick in. Don't underestimate my awesome genes and charm he told her when she checked on him in between shifts. Oh, charm, the little known cure-all, Lucille had said to him, but she sort of meant it. Even ill, sheen of sweat on his neck and face, he retained his allure as though nothing would touch him. And sure enough, he'd improved. It was well enough that she'd gone with Adut and baby James for Adut's zer a local exorcism to rid Adut of any evil spirits that might have lingered since she'd been through so much. She'd come back from the ceremony full with food, ready to regale Josh with a description of the intense spirit pulling. But Josh wasn't in his bed. He had wandered to the clinic, body stumbling, landed on the chaise where Diana and Dr. Betancourt had found him. Lucille had arrived in time to find chaos outside his room, the gruesome quiet inside. Now Lucille points to her stomach. I think I might be a little ill, she says to Adut, making motions about having eaten something bad. Adut shakes her head and says, I don't think so. She steps closer to Lucille. Lucille nods, their eyes meeting over what they both know is true. Adut holds the black funeral garb out to Lucille. Would it continue to fit months later in her third trimester? Or would she carry the thobe with her but not wear it? Which was the correct way, the most respectful for a kawaja. Lucille envisions wearing it on the plane home, only not home exactly, to Boston, to Josh's parents, his father in his judge's robe, his mother with two empty rooms, one room for her, one for this grandchild that they don't even know is coming toward them, careening straight into their lives like a rocket, a meteor, an unexpected scientific phenomenon that only after the fact makes perfect sense. Well, Michelle, what a wonderful reading. Thank you so much for that. Oh, that was so powerful. My goodness. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, well, thank you so much, Michelle. We always appreciate you being on the show. You always take such good care with the stories that we that we position for you. And I just, I always appreciate how much effort and, and bringing your wonderful talent to the stories. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Before we let you go, though, we want to tell everyone all about you. If um, our listeners are not familiar with Michelle, you should check out her, her readings on our previous episodes. But Michelle is a wonderful actress. She is a solo artist and a frequent reader here on Nobody Reads Short Stories. She just recently returned from Tokyo, where she filmed her first recurring series role in Lost Man Found, a new limited series coming to Disney Plus in the fall of 2022. Michelle resides in Los Angeles, California with one beloved husband, one amazing eight-year-old son, 
and one very bad, extremely loved orange tabby. You can find out all about Michelle on her Instagram at the Michelle Murphy and on her website, themichellemurphy.com. Thank you again, Michelle. We always appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. So tonight we have a very special guest who is going to um, do our author interview with me. Her name is uh, Catherine Vondi, and she is a Los Angeles-based writer, and I will read you all of her, her wonderful accomplishments here. Catherine Vondi is a writer and director working in film, theater, and literature. Her writing has been nominated for the Pushcart Prize, most recently by the Iowa Review, and has also appeared in journals including the Chicago Quarterly Review, Bellout Fiction Journal, Briar Clift Review, Quiddity, and Obart. She is the recipient of the Davy Foundation Theater Grant for her play, The Fermi Paradox, and The Broken Heart of Noki Bolanese, her award-winning short film, has screened in festivals worldwide. Kat currently leads the new play development program for the Los Angeles chapter of The Vagrancy, and she received her BA from Amherst College and her MFA from USC's School of Cinematic Arts. And if you want to follow Kat and her latest news, you can find her at her website, which is Catherine with a K, Bondi.com. So let's bring on Kat. Hi, Kat. Hey, Megan. Thanks for having me on. Oh, thank you for being here. I'm very, very excited for our, um, our listeners. Uh, so that so you know, Kat is actually a very good friend of mine, and I've known her for quite a quite a long time. So I'm very pleased to have her with us tonight for this conversation and to talk about Emily's story. So before before we start prattling on, though, I want to set cranky so that we don't overstep our time. And for those listeners who don't know. With um, we started off with with Jeremy doing cranky talk because Jeremy and I like to to talk too much, and we just find it useful with now that we have special guests just to make sure that you know we don't get off track and keep everybody way too long. <laughs> it's so good. It's we... good to put those boundaries in place. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you start talking, you get a bunch of people who really like talking about story and talking about literature and you know, they can kind of go on and on about their craft, which is fine. <laughs> so, so Kat, can you tell us a little bit about like what you resonated with this story? I remember when I sent it to you, you were like, I love this story. Yeah, I really enjoyed it because uh, even though it is not a, um, a, in a particular, you know, genre, it to me feels a little bit like a mystery story because mm -hmm. there are kind of clues dropped along the way where we don't really know what's what's going on with Lucille and her illness. Um, and I find myself as I'm going through it, the first time I read it, I wasn't sure, um, you know, does she have, uh, does she just have food poisoning? Does she have some illness? And then, you know, we hear about Joshua and I start to think, oh, maybe there's something else going on. So it really felt like mm -hmm. it took some of the conventions of a mystery, but took it out of that kind of like very specific genre and put it in a literary fiction context. Yeah, I, I love that because, because one of the things that I really love about this story is the tone. And, and for that reason, because it has a different sort of feel and a different sort of tone than I'm used to this sort of, you know, regular, quote unquote, regular literary fiction. And I think you, I think you hit it when you say that it that it has a little bit of a mystery to it, not just for Lucille's illness, but just almost kind of like figuring out um, this world and figuring out kind of like how Lucille is is navigating it. I feel like the way that Emily gives us information in this very specific way gives it a nice tone that you're that you're very interested in these everyday occurrences of this woman's life in a Absolutely. way that sometimes, you know, sometimes in literary fiction, you're like, I don't know if I care about this person, but I definitely do with Lucille. And it turns into something different than you might expect in the beginning, because the the first couple pages, you think, okay, this is a, a story about a, a clinic in an impoverished area and um, the things that the community has to go through. And it is about that, 
but at the same time, that's a lens that a very personal story of this one woman is kind of being shown through. And so I thought it just was really skillfully executed the way that it had, um, you know, kind of a, a very focused beginning and then expanded outwards. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I feel like sh this is a very, um, like an unknown world for me, like hospitals are unknown being in this impoverished area of this sort is unknown. Oops. See, that's why that's why we have to do this. I'll finish my thought. Yes. Um, and I think Emily just does a fantastic job of, of getting us into this world and establishing it for us so that we're like on our way and we're not I feel like I'm in very good hands with this story and with Agreed. Emily. Yes. All right. So before we bring Emily on, I just want to tell everyone, um, I just want to introduce Emily very quickly. So Emily Franklin is the author of more than 20 novels and a poetry collection. Tell me how you got here. Her award-winning work has appeared in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, Guernica, J-A-M-A and numerous literary magazines, as well as featured and read aloud on NPR and named notable by the Association of Jewish Libraries. This story, uh, The Registry of Displaced Persons, was long listed for the London Sunday Time Short Story Award, the biggest short story prize in the world. Franklin's novel, The Lioness of Boston, set in the 1800s in Boston and Europe, is about the life of outspoken Isabella Stewart Gardner and will be published in April. And you can find all of uh, Emily's other information and news at emilyfranklin.com. So let's bring Emily on. Hello. Hi, Emily. Hello. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for reading my long oh. story. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It was a pleasure. Yes, thank you so much, Emily. We appreciate you sending the story and we appreciate you you giving your time um, to us tonight. So um, can you just tell us a little bit about sort of what was the impetus for this story and how you, you started it off? Yeah, so I do a lot of, um, I really, I grew up in a family of doctors and really toyed with the idea of medical school and should I be a doctor who also writes or should I, should I be a writer who also writes about medicine? And it turns out I'm a writer who writes a lot about medicine and science. And I like to sort of learn more about medicine and math and all sorts of um, subjects. So, um, but the story for this um, really, I'm very, I think when I look at my work as a whole, I think a theme that comes up a lot is sort of, um, parenthood or motherhood specifically under unusual circumstances. And so that's often in the backdrop of my, my work. Um, and then um, I had done a bunch of listening to first person narratives um, set in clinics for doctors without borders. And I'm married to a physician and my first medical reader is actually a woman who runs an ER out in, in Washington state and she um, often helps me like with certain details if I'm getting things right. And so I'd basically been chewing over a narrative set in Sudan and I was, you know, trying to, it, you know, sometimes I sit down and I have an idea of where a story is going. And all I knew was that, you know, there was this doctor who was stationed here. That's what I knew. And I thought how interesting it would be if, if she were married so that it didn't seem like a setup for a romance. You know, this is not like, oh, we're in, you know, Sudan, what a, what a romantic setting. Um, this is obviously like super gripping and I really wanted it to read um, initially, you know, scattered throughout almost like an episode of, of ER, you know, really, so that it's these, these moments of life or death, but where's the humanity in there? And I didn't want her to be a sort of white savior in there. I wanted her mm -hmm. to really be experiencing the ups and downs of uh, not just physically, but emotionally, is she doing the right thing? You know, what are we, what's our, what are we, what purpose do we serve going into, you know, impoverished places? Um, and so then I really, once I started to write about her, I was trying to picture who, who else was there with her. And um, it just sort of un, unfurled in that way, but it really started off as, the baby who the, the 
the narrative I listened to um, was had elements of the baby, the underweight baby, who's not a baby, but turns out to be, you know, this toddler. Um, and so that was really the, the heart of it. And I thought, okay, is she able to save this one life? And then if I explored that, maybe the rest of the story would unfurl around it. And that's what happened. Oh, I, I love that. And I love that you started off with this element of motherhood, because I feel like that's something that I'm, even though I'm not a mother, it's something that I, I love to read stories about it from a different angle, like you mentioned. And that was one of the things that really drew me to this story was how she, she is married, she doesn't have children, but she's, she's connecting to these babies. And, and she seems like the type of woman that we would kind of put in a box as like, oh, she's, you know, she's a strong, independent woman, and she's not going to have children. But yet, she obviously has these connections, these motherly instincts, these like motherly uh, feelings toward these children. And even, you know, at the end, when they hand her the baby, she's like, oh, is that, you know, am I going to, are they giving me this baby? You know, it's like she has these sort of right. instincts for that. Right. And that I think, um, are, are well explored in this story just because it's in a, in a way that we don't really see from a character like Lucille. Mm -hmm. um, well, and I, and I liked the idea of also setting up a woman who, because of who she is and because of where she's been positioned all over the world doing this, she's quite a hardened person. Mm -hmm. And yet the woman that she befriends, a dude, you know, whose baby she's looking after um, or whose child she's looking after it, you know, there's a softening that happens to her throughout. And, you know, Josh happens to soften her also, you know, to make her less of a um, sort of walled off person. Um, I think we get that sense very clearly just in the way that the prose is written, because I have the sense that Lucille is somebody who um, maybe is, is not even aware of her own feelings and her own changing mm -hmm. attitudes towards motherhood as she is going through them, because there's a, a little bit of a, a sense of distance when she's working with the, the underweight child that she almost um, feels kind of like an observer thinking about her, her own emotions and how she's relating to this, this child. Um, and that to me comes across really clearly in just the way that words are used to de describe her feelings and you know her actions throughout this whole piece right well that's that's such a good observation i think that's really mm -hmm. smart and i think that i loved your um theory that this sort of reads like a mystery almost and i think it is because um um uh, you know and a little bit for me it was a mystery writing it i didn't really know i was I, when i finally got to the end and i was like oh god i don't think he makes it uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and then I thought, mm -hmm. oh, I think all along I've set that up. And often that's the best writing that happens for me where it feels as though it's being revealed to me. Obviously, it's my brain. I did it, but it doesn't feel as though I had that narrative control. But I think, um, you know, to have it be soft, you know, to have her soften enough and be um, so it's almost the mystery is revealed to her as it's revealed to the reader is what I wanted. And so that that last line is sort of telescoped to the end, you know, that she would ultimately go back to, you know, Josh's parents who are losing their only child and then become, you know, grandparents. And, you know, it's it sort of comes together at the end. Well, yeah. and it's such a, an interesting way that you um, sort of drop us the information because in a, in a sense, when we do finally find out that she's pregnant, it's almost like you've buried the lead because it's it's the the line where it comes it's it's almost sort of um not exactly an aside but it's not like you're emphasizing it like oh my gosh i'm i'm pregnant or this this woman is pregnant it's it comes along um very quietly but because the breadcrumbs have been dropped along the way i feel like it has more of an impact um mm -hmm. than it would if you really tried to like bang us over the head with that information right. mm -hmm. i think that's true and i also felt that for lucille you know, her pregnancy isn't a medical emergency. So she's not going to be like arrows, arrows, me, me, me. You know, it's just this subtle thing. This is a condition that happens to everybody who, you know, everybody who was presented on this earth, you know, somebody was pregnant with them. And so this is just an, an average thing, but how it sort of ends up and where she ends up physically 
and sort of, you know, it'll be the dissolution of her marriage and where she winds up geographically and all of that stuff, you know, will will follow suit because the sort of circumstances, Josh's death and the pregnancy will guide her there. Yeah, I, I love that. And um, going back to Kat's comment about Lucille figuring out her own emotions, and as the story goes along, I feel like the ending supports that as well. Like Lucille does not strike me as the type of person who would have this like, you know, large reaction to finding out that she's pregnant. She's a doctor to your point, Emily, she, you know, yeah. this is a, you know, something that happens biologically and, and it's something that she's aware of, but I like how you, you have that subtle kind of reveal for her, but then at when you land with your last bit at the end where you talk about it being this sort of meteoric, uh, experience and and I in my mind I imagine Lucille kind of getting to that point you know through her processing what's happening in the dissolution of her marriage and all of that and and so her emotional evolution continues for me or at least is how sort of I I read that at the end and I think that, that I'm glad that it does because that's how I wanted it to be and I also wanted it to be that she was on this mission to change the lives of others by helping them while under the misguided assumption that she herself would not be changed. Mm -hmm. And yet she is somebody who at the end is vastly changed and not just changed emotionally, but changed physically. So she's coming back. Um, and and at that last line that I wanted that it makes perfect sense, like to her logical brain, this is, oh, okay. So this is, this is sort of the circumference I've traveled to get here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Do you feel like, do you resonate with Lucille? Like, do you feel like Lucille is a part she's, of you? She's not very much like me. I mean, sometimes I can I can look at characters that I've written and think, okay, well, that's pulling a certain amount for me. Josh is, is a little bit more um, <laughs> like me. Um, but I think the part that is like me is I, you know, I definitely have a harder time shutting my brain off. I'm always thinking about things as I'm experiencing those things. So there's sort of like the me and the meta me <laughs> existing at the same time. But I think that's part of the writerly lens, you know, you're recording stuff in your brain for later. Um, but no, she's, she's not like me. And in some ways that made her a lot easier to, to write. Um, and, um, I think it was fun for me to to introduce Josh because he's this much more laid back. He's funny. He's much more in touch with his feelings. Um, and so it was interesting for me to sort of put them on the page together and see like, would they, you know, rub each other the wrong way? Would they rub each other the right way? You know, <laughs> all of those things. So, I'm yeah. curious about with, um, the way that the the story moves through time because it's not chronological. So just in terms of as you were drafting it, um, how did the story come out? Did it come out chronologically or did it come out in pieces that you then had to reorder? Um, yeah, it was really tricky. <laughs> it was a really tricky um, chronology to get right. Um, but what I really wanted to have was the baby is the through line. You know, the underweight baby is the through line. But um, I really wanted it to 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 almost be like a really good episode, a long episode of TV, you know, um, where we're cutting back and forth between the scenes to, because also that's what life in a clinic is like. If you've spent any time in, you know, a hospital or, a, you know, a field hospital, any, anything like that, it's not like, well, here's the one shot that's going all the way through. It's like, now we're with this character. Now I got to go back and check on this person. Then I got to go back in and check on that character. So I tried to um, look at that structure for the timing and then within that think, well, you know, none of this is really going to be anything more than a medical episode unless we know more about how these people met and what their relationship is like. And once I sort of figured out, um, you know, that, you know, Josh was sick and that, you know, I set it up obviously to look like food poisoning. It's not food poisoning, all of those things. Then I made sure that that was woven all the way through. Um, there was a lot of stuff. This... Um, Believe it or not, this was an even longer story, <laughs> and I had to cut <laughs> I cut a whole bunch um, of stuff out um, just because I really liked the characters, and I love writing about medicine. And so there were some other patients that they saw um, 
the the siblings who come in with the snake bite um that was a, a longer more drawn out um situation um but yeah it, it was a it was a tricky um back and forth to get right and so but i knew that i think when i first started it i I always think, oh, I'm going to write a simple story. It will go, it will start here and we will go forward in time. <laughs> and often, <laughs> I mean, very rarely does that happen. And I really have to be careful with my backstory because um, something I think that's so important with writing, like when I teach writing, I always um, talk, you know, like the, the present has to be as exciting as the past. Otherwise, you know, they have to be equally exciting. Otherwise you should just live in the past or the present. And why are you going back and forth? You shouldn't wish you were in the other one. And this way, I really wanted to make sure that they were both equally gripping. The past likely gripping because you're watching this romance on, you know, sort of take off. And then the, the present because of the medical stuff and you're trying to figure out what's actually going on and, and who's gonna live and who's gonna die. And it isn't who you think is gonna live and die. Um, but yeah, so that was, that was tricky. But I thought it would be one way and it turned out the other. Well, especially yeah. because you have to not tip your hand with the per, like the present perspective of what has happened in the past. And I think that also is something that contributes to Lucille's feeling of a, a little bit of alienation because um, she, she can't completely process what has happened in the past yet. And that is another thing I think that's contributing to her ability to process the present. Right. Because there's also the sort of recent past, the funeral. Mm -hmm. And then there's the more, you know, when she's talking about the flooding and when Josh first arrived and there's stuff that she has more ability to process. I think that's true. Yeah, absolutely. At what point did you add the, um, like, the texting with the brother? And I'm that, always was there, that was there from the beginning because... Okay. Um, I often, and most, so most things were there from the beginning. I don't do a lot of having to add like that because mm. when I'm thinking about Lucille and I'm thinking, who is she, you know, there's probably somebody in her life that she's less guarded with. Mm. And, um, it's not her husband who sounds sort of schmucky. Like, <laughs> I mean, I made him schmucky, but to me, I was like, God, he's kind of a dick. Um, <laughs> But um, she's very close with her brother. And I have two brothers and I'm um, very, very close with them. And, um, and I'm close with my brother-in-law. And, you know, and I was picturing how, also how strange it is to, to be in one place doing one kind of work and be able to text your, you know, brother who's in a completely different situation across the globe, you know, um, and be very funny and candid with with him and so i wanted also that's really until she is closer to josh it's really the only trace we have that she has a softer part of her or a funnier part of her um or less intense part of her yeah. i loved that the brother texted in stage directions yes, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> i did too <laughs> Yeah, I thought I thought their dynamic was very charming, and I and I I did very much appreciate seeing that that softer and tr more charming side of her, uh, even though it was in this in this long distance sort of way. I think it I think it really added a lot to to us being endeared to Lucille, right? But also because she is sort of rudderless and anchorless, just to give her a lot of boat metaphor there. But she. Um, I always curious with people who choose a particular kind of work, you know, whether you're on an oil rig and you are, you know, are you alone in that? Are you leaving people behind? Who are the other people in your life? And so I wanted to make sure that the reader knew and that I knew who else she um, had in her life. And um, so, it would, so it would make sense at the end too. So it wasn't like, well, why would she go back to Josh's family? You know, we know that she'll she'll have a good relationship with her brother, not particularly close with her mother, you know, um, all of that. So, yeah, that's that was great. Well, Emily, thank you so much. Is there is there anything else that you would like to add, or Cad? Is there anything else that you would like to ask Emily before we before we end? I do have one other question, sure. um, if we have time for it. Yeah, I, it's sort of a more general question, um, Emily. I was wondering. Um, what your research process is, because um, I know that you have, it seems like you have a lot of familiarity with the medical world, but knowing that your novel is 
a period piece set in a, another historical time, I'm imagining that research might be like a, a important part of your writing process. So I was yeah. just curious if you had, you know, any um, right. thoughts on that. I think that's, um, I, I do a lot of research. Um, the Lioness of Boston that comes out in April is, again, it's sort of a biopic novel. It's based on the life of Isabella Stewart Gardner. So sort of the age of innocence, but Boston based. And, um, and she's a real person. So, and I started the research for that novel while writing another novel that referenced the Gardner heist. There was this huge, you know, art heist at the Gardner Museum. Um, and so research in general for me is very pleasurable. Um, I love period details. I love learning new things, whether it's a medical procedure or if you're choosing a kind of stitch that somebody would give in skin, which kind of stitch would it be? I want to get all those details right, um, both because I enjoy it, but I also find it's very annoying if you're a reader who has knowledge in that particular area that somebody didn't do the research, that it's, it's not that hard in this day and age. Um, and so for me, it's really a question of when to stop the research. You've done enough, put it down. I really liked school, I was good at school. <laughs> you know, I need to <laughs> just put it down. You can't just do more research. You have to actually do the other work. Um, and so um, I try to give myself the, the enough um, leeway with research, um, but then know when to put it away. And for stories like this, I think, um, I'm always open to story. So whether I'm reading something um, in the morning when I'm on the elliptical or I'm listening to NPR or um, learning something new or I went to a food lecture and, and got an idea, you know, um, just to be open to ideas and then figure out how I could research and find a story there. I love that. Uh, I do too. I love that. I love you're making yourself stop the research so that you have to, it's like, okay, you have to actually write the story. Now. Right. You have to do the hard part. You know, right. you know, research is hard in its own way, but you're really just compiling a lot of stuff and then you have to write the paper. Like I can remember, I remember at one point growing up, my father being like, it's a beautiful book report cover. You need to write the book report. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I'll put the markers away. <laughs> um, so I was trying to remind myself that I need to to do that part. Oh, um, I love but that. But that's I what gives it, it. That's what gives stories their richness. You know, we were like, I had no idea that's how lamp posts were invented, or like, you know. But it also goes the other way. I remember I had part of the histor You know, a different historic piece um, was talking about was set in a restaurant and there were these linoleum floors and I went into the history of how linoleum was created. <laughs> and at one point my agent was like, do you know it's possible that not everybody finds that as fascinating as you do? And I was like, okay, I think it's really cool. There's pine resin in there. You know? so. Those readers are nuts yeah. if they don't think that's interesting. I know. What's wrong with them? I know. Tell me more. Exactly. Exactly. But with, with um, the Lioness of Boston, I was very careful because when I mentioned like what street lamps looked like in the 1800s in Boston, I did not go into the history of street lamps and how they were created, <laughs> even though I know that. I just didn't include it. <laughs> Maybe it'll find its way into something else. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the there. It's like, I, I, yes, you have to steal from yourself later. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, once they they turn it into a TV show or they turn it into a filmmaker or to a film, you can hand it over to the. That's right. Sure, Sharon and or Kate wins. It'll be like it was all down to the street lamp for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I knew I wanted to play Isabella Stewart. <laughs> The history of the street lamps did it for me. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm in good hands with this woman's work. <laughs> right. Um, well, Emily, thank you so much. This has been this has been lovely. Thank you again for taking the time and for sending us your story. Uh, we've thoroughly enjoyed it and thoroughly enjoyed you being here. Well, thank you so much for hosting me and for taking the time um, for reading it and okay. and having me here. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much. We will hopefully see you again soon. I hope so, thank you. Okay. All right, and Kat, thank you for being our special host tonight. This has been lovely. It's been lovely having you in conversation with Emily and just seeing your face and hearing your voice and your thoughts. So thank you also for uh, taking the time to be with us. Thank you for the invitation. This was super fun. 
Yay, I'm so glad. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Kat. Thanks. Bye. All right. So that concludes another fantastic episode of Nobody Reads Short Stories. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. You can find all of our previous episodes at nobodyreadshortstories.com. Watch all of our videos on YouTube. Please like and subscribe as well as download. You can download our audio podcast from Stitcher, Google, Amazon, um, Apple Podcasts, basically anywhere you listen to your audio podcast, you can find us. So thank you so much and we will see you guys soon. No one reads short stories anymore I really don't know what they're written for Go write a short story and throw it out the door Cause no one reads short stories Funny, sad, or gory No one reads short stories Yes, no one reads short stories anymore.